I will instead uh, give you an update where we are on trying to understand the chemistry that happens uh, where planets are forming in disks, such as the one illustrated here around young stars. I do want to just start out with, with acknowledging that uh, the vast majority of the work I will be presenting is not primarily done by me, uh, but it's done by a really amazing team of uh, junior scientists as and the ones that are in my group are, are listed here that really span in a full range of both kind of methods we're using from theory to observations to laboratory experiments, as well as the different stages of star and planet formation that in different ways contribute to what kind of planets you end up with. The fundamental motivation for pretty much all the work that, that we do uh, is, is sort of twofold. Uh, but they're closely connected. One is to understand the origins of our own home a bit better. And I'm showing it here with the Earth as an example, but I'm really thinking about the solar system. So why the solar system looks the way it does. But the other half of that story is that we now know that you know, the Earth, our solar system, is just a, you know, one out of many, many planets and planetary systems in our galaxy, and of course in other galaxies as well, and understanding, trying to be able to predict what the chemical composition uh, of those other planets could be is the other thing that I'm really interested in. With, and in both cases, with the eyes towards the conditions that make a planet hospital, hospitable for, for audience of life. Uh, when we think about an Earth-like planet, so a terrestrial planet, there's several different stages of that planet's formation when you can acquire volatiles and organic molecules, the things that we think about as being important for origins of life. I mean, a planet like the Earth, it assembles from sort of grains, pebbles, and boulders in one of these protoplanetary disks. And these solids can have small amounts of volatiles incorporated into them. So when we look at things like meteorites, we see that they do have small amounts of water, for example, inside of the mineral. Uh, if the planet becomes big enough, and it turns out that big enough is actually a bit smaller than the Earth, uh, it can start uh, both accrete and hold on to a primary atmosphere that it just accretes directly out uh, of the disk. And this atmosphere will then uh, sample sort of the composition that's in the gas around 1 AU. Uh, but in this in the case of the Earth, it seems we lost most of this atmosphere, and we don't yet know uh, for exoplanet Earth analogs whether we should expect most of them to have a lot of their primary atmosphere available or whether they ha often have lost theirs as well. There is a, a second or I guess a third chance for a terrestrial planet to acquire vo volatile, and that's through impacts. And now we're talking about things like, you know, asteroid-like bodies, comet-like bodies, that can bring in volatiles from basically all of the protoplanetary disk. So if we want to be able to predict the volatile composition of an Earth-like planet, we are going to need uh, a holistic view of the chemistry of these uh, planet-forming disks. Since even the solids that are at the very you know, beginning, these solids that are sitting at 1 AU when the planet is forming, they might actually have drifted in from 50 AU. So we do need to observe the chemistry at all radii in the disk to be able to predict the chemical composition of a terrestrial planet. But it's even in some sense more complex than that, because the chemical composition of a disk doesn't start from zero when the disk forms. So this is just a cartoon of how um, a solar type star forms. So you, you have your interstellar cloud collapses to form a prestellar core. Uh, in this prestellar core, you form a protostar with a protostellar disk. Over time, you uh, accrete material onto the disk and the star and disperse the nascent cloud. All you're left with is, is a protoplanetary disk within which the planetary system forms. But the chemistry, like each of these stages, have their own sort of unique and special chemistry, and that is going to impact what, uh, what you start with in the disk. So the way I want to structure this talk is I'm going to spend a little bit of time just walking through in these sort of early stages of star and sort of disk formation, uh, what kind of 
sort of chemical signatures we expect to carry with us into the disk. But then I will be spending most of the time on the disk itself because we have some really cool results that I want to, to share with you there. So if we start with the, with the cloud, so there's like interstellar clouds with cores uh, sort of spread out in them. If we observe the grains, the solids uh, in these clouds, and we can do that with infrared spectroscopy. So James Webb is going to be really awesome to continue this work. What we see is that when we look close to the edges of the cloud in the not so dense regions of dense clouds, we see the first, we see the beginnings of formation of ice uh, on, on top of these uh, sort of submicron grains. As you move deeper and deeper into the cloud, and if you look in the top figures here, that means going down. So you see new features, spectroscopic features appearing that are from new ices. And also in the right-hand panel, uh, as you go towards, uh, towards the center, so to I guess in towards sort of 2500 AU from the center, you see the increase of these new icy, icy components. And it's the formation of these ices and how that depends on the, dense, on the density and the temperature of the cloud uh, that sets what kind of carbon and oxygen and nitrogen containing species that you have at this first stage, so this cloud stage. Uh, I should say it's not just the, this ice formation, it is the ice formation chemistry together with two other things. One is photodissociation, which is sort of the negative part, so how easy a molecule gets photodissociated. And the other is the gas phase formation of a couple of molecules like CO and N2. So the balance between photodissociation on one hand and then gas and ice, ice formation on the other at this cloud stage is really what divides up carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen between their main molecular reservoirs. Um, so what are these uh, main molecular reservoirs? Well, we know it for somewhat. We, th we, we know what these are by now. If we start with carbon, it's the easiest. Here we, th we have sort of mapped out roughly where the carbon is in these clouds. About half of it is in some sort of refractory phase, and most of the rest is in CO, with some organics in CO2 there as well. For oxygen, we have a lot in water, CO, and silicates, but we also have this gray unknown uh, part of the pie here, which may be in large water grains, we're not sure. Nitrogen looks even worse, but here we actually are pretty, we think we're pretty sure what this biggest component is, this gray one. We think that's molecular nitrogen, which we just can't see uh, spectroscopically. We have good reasons to think that these reservoirs are preserved largely intact from the cloud into the disk. Uh, one of the evidence from that comes from the solar system. When we look at the amount of heavy water compared to normal water, there's a lot of heavy water. We think this originates from this cloud phase and therefore is a signature that the water that we have on Earth or in comets uh, survived this, this different sort of in-between stages between the cloud and the disk. Um, so things like this, these sort of abundant volatiles, things like water, we think their abundance is to a large extent set already in this cloud phase. Uh, as we transition from the cloud phase to the pre-stellar core, we do see things like methanol forming in the ice. Uh, and we think that a lot of that survives too. And this is a very recent beautiful paper by Alice Booth which shows the detection of methanol in a protoplanetary disk. Now we have seen methanol before in these disks, but what's unique about this observation is that the disk where she sees it, it cannot have formed. This disk is too warm. So methanol forms from CO ice, and CO ice sublimates when you're roughly at 20 to 25 Kelvin, and there's no region in, the, in this disk that's cold enough. So the only way to explain uh, oh. this methanol uh, is by having it inherited and then sublimated into the gas phase. So we have good reason to think that I said, both simple organics and a lot of these other volat small volatiles, they form early on and then survive and are present where plants are forming uh, in disks. The next stage is the protostellar stage. Uh, once we get to the protostar, uh, there are some dramatic changes to the environment. 
that a grain or a package of gas uh, is seeing compared to a cloud phase. If you're far away from the protostar, when you think about this, you know, this envelope is sort of creating onto the, pro onto the protostar. If you're far away, it's pretty much like a cloud. Uh, you have a little bit of radiation around, which might break up some of the organics like methanol that you formed early on, uh, but it's too cold for a lot of chemistry to happen. But once you get close enough, uh, think about the grain as sort of streaming towards the protostar, uh, once you get to around 30 Kelvin or so in this protostellar envelope, things can start to move around inside the icy mantles of these grains, and you can start combining sort of broken pieces of methanol into larger and larger molecules. And if you get really close to the central protostar, well, then it's warm enough, uh, both due to shocks and due to just passive heating, that all the ice, including these new, more complex organic molecules, can sublimate uh, into the gas phase. Uh, we see very clear observational evidence for this. Uh, so these, uh, this is spectra taken towards the center of one of these protostars. And you see this very rich spectra, most of which uh, most of these lines here are due to rather complex organic molecules that are oxygen rich. So the third, third stage and the final one before we get to the disk, what characterizes characterize the protostellar stage from a chemical point of view is that you get this sort of next generation of organic molecules. So when we have our disk, which is coming next, that one has now inherited a whole set of molecules from the earlier generations, from simple things like water uh, up to rather complex organic molecules. And this is one complication when trying to uh, predict what the chemical structure of uh, these protoplanetary disks are. The other is just the rather complex interaction between sort of dynamics and chemistry that's going on in these disks themselves. So we have all this inherited chemistry. We also expect to have new chemical reactions taking place in these disks, uh, primarily because you're sitting now very close to the star. These disks are small compared to clouds, there's sort of hundreds of AU. And the UV light from the central star, we think will drive uh, a rather impressive UV mediated chemistry uh, in these disks. But then you also have a lot of dynamics, especially grains that settle from high, like from high up in the disk down to the midplane that drifts towards the central star. Um, we have accretion flows that takes gas both inward and outward. Um, and we have turbulence that moves things around. So it's not obvious at all that where, let's say, a package of gas or dust lands from the protostellar accretion phase, that that's going to be where that package of dust and gas stays. Nor is it obvious that if a molecule forms, for example, up in the disk atmosphere, that it will stay there. It might make its way towards the, the midplane one way or another. So this all makes this a very difficult theoretical problem to model these disks. Now we are trying to do it. We, I think we are making some inroads, uh, but to, develop, to guess, figure out what is fruitful, what are fruitful directions for these models, as well as to get some idea of uh, what these models should be predicting, you do need observations to anchor those models. And that's really what I want to spend most of the rest of our time together are some, I think, very new and exciting observations that we have acquired of these disks. And these observations are all possible thanks to ALMA. So I mean, ALMA is this you know, gorgeous telescope done in Chile, which consists of 66 dishes it op um, operates at millimeter wavelengths, and millimeter wavelengths are very powerful to study chemistry because molecules rotate. And when molecule, molecules rotate, uh, or like they spin up or spin down, um, they absorb or emit uh, light at millimeter wavelengths. So ALMA is really perfectly situated to take advantage of this sort of quantum mechanical fact. So I'm going to be showing a lot of uh, chemical maps uh, of disks. So I just want to I guess, show what um, these maps are. So the maps you might have seen of protoplanetary disks already uh, come from continuum observations, where you just integrate over a lot of wavelengths at a millimeter wavelengths, 
Um, and you get these beautiful structured disks, uh, disk images like shown, what's shown here. Uh, and that's really tracing the millimeter pebbles or dust grains. But we know that there are spectral features in these disks due to molecules. And if you take the, if you isolate the photons just from those spectral features, you can make analogous maps, but with only photons coming from specific molecules, in this case, formaldehyde. So we have, for the past two years, been running a program uh, with, with ALMA, and these are my, the four, uh, four co-PIs, as well as this amazing team of more junior scientists that are leading, I think, I think the co-PIs are leading like two out of 20 papers and the other 18 are led by uh, uh, graduate students, postdocs, and a couple of assistant professors. And I can say I couldn't ask for a better team. Everyone has been absolutely amazing. So just a big you know, call out to everyone who has contributed to this project. But the, what we did with the project is that we selected five disks that we thought were especially interesting and then we surveyed these disks at pretty high spatial resolution, down to 0.1 arc seconds, in a bunch of different, uh, different molecules. And uh, these are the disks, so they're continuum structure. Again, think about this as their dust or pebble structure. And the four questions that we set out trying to answer is first of all, so we see this structure, the substructure in the pebbles. How does that impact the chemistry? If there is a planet forming in one of these gaps, will that gap be experiencing a different chemistry compared to the surrounding regions, for example? A second thing that we're especially interested in is the, are the organic, organic molecules because of their possible connection to audience of life on, on any planets that are forming or will exist in the future in these, around these stars. Uh, we are interested in the elemental ratios in the gas, since that will go into setting the elemental ratios of things like gas giants and other primary atmospheres, so planets. And finally, what we can do with these observations is start mapping out the vertical structure of these disks. So these res the resolutions we are at are just good enough that we can really start resolving uh, not just where the molecules are radially, but also where they are uh, vertically. So let's start uh, just uh, and look a little bit at how the, chemis the chemical substructure, how that compares with, the, with where the pebbles are located in these, in these disks. So these are, these are a subset of the chemical maps that uh, we are investigating. So you see each column here is a different star or disk, and then each row is a, is a different molecule. So the first thing to just notice is that there is quite a lot of substructure. So just as we saw, you know, rings and gaps in the dust, we're seeing rings and gaps in these uh, different molecules. So we can, but looking at it like this is actually quite difficult by eye to pick out all the substructure because of the, the dynamical range we have to deal with. So it's easier if we just zoom in on a single disk and also look at what the radial profile looks like. We're just now basically taking a cut along the major axis in the disk. And you can see that we have basically up to four rings uh, in, a single, in a single disk and molecule. And that if you look at the one disk and five molecules, it's almost like you see five different uh, disks that we need to somehow understand based on the chemistry that's going on in these disks. Similarly, if we look in, a similar, in one molecule, but look uh, along our five disks, we see a similar set of just uh, similar, I guess, diversity uh, in, in substructure across these disks. So where does this substructure come from? When it comes to explaining substructure in pebbles, there are many possible explanations, including planets carving out the gaps that we are seeing. Um, can we explain the chemistry by something else? Is it just following the dust, basically, or is something else going on? Well, we can start with the simplest molecule, the chemically simplest molecule, which is CO. CO is often used as a tracer of gas uh, because it is chemically relative inactive, though that is a big, big caveat to actually think that there's been quite a lot of processing in some of these disks of CO. Uh, but what's shown here is the, 
is the gap depth that we see in CL in the five disks. So we've taken a bunch of different lines from CL and calculate the column densities of CL based on that, and then look at sort of the gaps uh, that, that we see across the disk. Uh, so that's in the lighter color, and then in the darker color are the gaps that we see in dust in the same disks. So a couple of things to, to sort of comment on here. One is that what we see in the disk, like MWC 480 down here, where you have sort of a shallower and wider gap in gas, and it see is really tracing the gas, in, in, so in CO or gas versus dust, that's roughly what you expect if these gaps are carved out by planets. And we do see that in a number of places. But we also see uh, disks where there's no CO gap, where we, see, where we have dust gaps. And there are some times when it's not obvious that you actually have this wider and shallower uh, gap in the, in the gas than you do in the dust. So one of the things, this doesn't mean that we can rule out planets carving out all the dust gaps, but what it does mean is that a single kind of dust gap can result in many different kinds of gas properties. And that actually should be sort of first step to, to trying to constrain how these gaps formed in the first place, and especially whether they're carved out by planets. We do see substructure in every single molecule that we look in, so we could make similar figures for sort of our other uh, 15 molecules or so. Uh, instead, I'm just going to show a single example where we are in one disk, we are comparing uh, the locations of dust gaps and rings with the locations of chemical rings and gaps. So the yellow uh, lines and are the dust rings, the gray dashed lines are the dust gaps, and then the circles are chemical rings and the uh, squares are chemical gap. Sorry, the circles are chemical gaps and the squares are chemical rings. And um, the main thing that I want you to take away is that if we look at two of the dust gaps, so one that's called D49 and one that's called D85, we see almost the opposite kind of relationship between that dust gap and the chemical structure. So in one case, we have a lot of chemical gaps, and in the other case, we have, we have a lot of chemical rings. And that is sort of just reinforcing what I said already before, that it looks like we have a range of gas and chemical properties in dust gaps that otherwise looks the same. So this is also suggesting we can use, again, this chemistry to probe the properties of these gaps. But it does not explain why we see the chemical gaps and rings that we do. And I would say that is, we have, the one thing we can say is that there doesn't seem to be one single explanation of the chemical substructure, because it's definitely not just gas gap, or like dust gaps. It's not just snow lines. And it, it's just not radiation at gradients it is most likely some combination of those uh, three. Um, but I quickly want to move on to our second question, uh, which is that of elemental ratios uh, in these rings. So going back for some time, we have been thinking about what elemental ratios should you expect in the gas in these disks. And the reason we have been thinking about that is that that is one of the things that is we think is preserved in planet atmospheres, even as planetary chemistry changes what carriers of these atoms that you have. So when James Webb is now, hopefully soon, going to start acquiring spectra from a different kinds of planets, exoplanets, uh, one of the main things that uh, exoplanet scientists will be looking for is constraining the elemental ratios uh, in the atmospheres of these planets. And it would, of course, be really great if we can connect that to the elemental ra ratios of the gas in these disks that these atmospheres originate from. So in the simplest case, these uh, elemental ratios are simply set by the snow lines of the major carriers of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and, and sulfur uh, in these disks. So if you look at the carbon to oxygen, you know, every time you pass a snow line that has a carbon or an oxygen in that molecule, you will change the ratio of carbon to oxygen both in the gas and in the dust. 
But the main thing that I want to point out here is that the maximum carbon to oxygen ratio that you can get to is about unity. And that's because CO is such an important carrier of carbon and oxygen. So when everything else has frozen out and the only thing that's left in the gas phase is carbon monoxide, you get to that unity uh, level. We can test this hypothesis uh, because there are some of the molecules uh, in our survey, uh, especially this little hydrocarbon, C2H, uh, which is very sensitive to the carbon to oxygen ratio uh, in the gas phase. So by modeling uh, how much C2H we should see and compare it to what we see, uh, we can start getting a, getting sort of a real, real constraint of what this, this ratio, the C2O ratio is like. So the outcome of one of these modeling projects is, is shown here. So the three panels are three different disks. And in each case, this sort of gray, uh, uh, I guess, line plus the uncertain, that has some uncertainty to it, uh, that's the observations of C2H. Well, it's not exactly the observations, it's the column density profile that's inferred from our observations. The different colors uh, shows the predictions from three different models that has it as its input the carbon to oxygen ratio uh, in, in the gas. And what you see is that it's not really enough uh, to have a carbon to oxygen ratio, ratio of unity to reproduce these observations. You need to have a carbon to oxygen ratio that's more than twice than that in most cases. And that cannot be explained by the snow line model alone. For that, you need some other source uh, of carbon getting into the gas phase. Perhaps some of that refractory carbon uh, is somehow becoming volatile and uh, getting some of those carbon atoms into the disk atmosphere. That is, I would say, very speculative at this point, um, but it would be a very interesting result since the inner solar system, in our case here, is actually quite carbon poor. So it seems like there are ways to lose this refractory carbon, exactly through which mechanism is still, still debated. The third question was, what does the vertical structure of these disks look like? So this image here is not from our program. Uh, this is a scattered light image showing the infrared uh, scattered light, which traces the micron-sized particles in disks. And we think the gas and the micron-sized particles are distributed approximately the same way. Now we can, uh, we can also see, if you look at disks in millimeter dust, they look like pancakes because the big pebbles, they have all settled towards the midplane. But the gas that we think should look something like this scattered light image. And if we have enough resolution, we should be able to pick that out. To show you that we can do this, I'm gonna for a moment have to step away from our nice, simple chemical maps and instead show you what the data actually uh, looks like, which is this. So we, have, we don't have so much um, chemical images as we have chemo, like Im spectral image cubes. So each panel here uh, is the disk in one spectral line, but just split up at different uh, you know, wavelength bins or velocities. And because these are Keplerian disks, you see what is a very typical velocity pattern for a Keplerian rotated disk. For example, you can see that the wings, the velocity wings, that's very compact emission because it's coming from very close uh, to the star. But what I want to focus on is that if you look towards the center, the central panels, you can see that we can see both the front and the back of the disk and that there's some angle in between. And this is the amount that the gas is flared. It's maybe a little bit easier to see um, or more obvious if we just look at a single channel but look at it in all five disks and in three different C isotopologues. So this is all the same molecule, but as you get to rare isotopologues, uh, the line is more optically thin, which means you can look closer to the midplane. So if you look at just a single disk, 
you see that as you go to rarer and rarer isotopologues, the disk becomes flatter and flatter and flatter. Uh, so what you're seeing here is sort of this optic, like the surface where the line becomes optically thick, uh, basically in each case. So we can use this to map out the vertical structure of the disk. In particular, we can, you know, for at each radius in the disk, uh, we can pick out what the height, the emitting height is of each of the C isotopologues. Uh, and that in the case, if you have three C isotopologues, we get sort of three anchors uh, moving down towards the midplane. So for CO13, CO18 and O. Because the lines are optically thick, I said where we see them is basically the surface where they become optically thick. We can use that to get the temperature uh, of the disk. Uh, this just shows it qualitatively. This is where it looks like more quantitatively for the five disks. So we have these actually empirical temperature structures of the disks, uh, both radially uh, and vertically. For the molecules that we are interested in and knowing exactly where they're located, and this might especially be the kind of volatiles and organics that we are interested in from an audience of life point of view, we can also use this technique to tell how far away they are from the midplane. So the disk midplane is where planets form. So if we have molecules that, you know, that we're seeing that's way above that, it's going to be pretty difficult for them to make it all the way down to the midplane without being destroyed or changed in some way. But in the case, uh, in this case, and this is one of the molecules that we're the most interested in, in tracking is hydrogen cyanide. We see that when we are at radii of, sort of less than an arc second, which means about less than 100 AU, uh, the hydrogen cyanide is emitting actually fairly close to the midplanes. We are really tracing the organic chemistry when we look at this molecule that is happening very close to where planets are, are forming. And that naturally leads into the final question, uh, which is uh, about the organics uh, in this disk. So hydrogen cyanide uh, is one of several organic molecules uh, that, that we see. So this is a full gallery of the organic molecules that have been detected to date in disks. On the one hand, this is really impressive. There's quite a lot of them. Uh, but for anyone who has seen any other astrochemistry talks that maybe focus on protostars or on the clouds, this would actually be a bit pathetic in comparison. And the reason for that is not that we think that these disks are chemically poor. They're just tiny and faint. Uh, so it is very difficult to see any molecules. Uh, but these are ones we have seen. Uh, so these are ones we could follow that we can actually use to follow how the chemistry develops in these planet forming disks. Out of these molecules, we are especially interested in this blue family here. So blue here means nitrogen, red is oxygen, and yellow is sulfur. And we're especially interested in this blue family because these are all so-called nitriles, hydrogen cyanide being the smallest and maybe paradigmatic uh, sort of member of this family. And the reason we are so interested in these nitriles is that there is a very promising um, scenario of the chemistry that here on Earth uh, led to sort of prebiotic chemistry that led to the origins of life, which has hydrogen cyanide at its center. So this is the cartoon version, but there are some really beautiful and very complicated chemistry papers that explains why this works. Uh, but the bottom line is that if you have hydrogen cyanide in a water, think the sort of like pond-like environment, uh, you have a little bit of H2S and you have some UV light. You very readily form all the molecules that we think of as building blocks of things like proteins, RNA, uh, cell walls, uh, and the like. And it's very difficult to get anything like this chemistry if you don't have hydrogen cyanide and or other nitriles uh, around. So I already showed you this. So I've been, this is uh, the, the hydrogen, one of the hydrogen cyanide lines that we have in our sample uh, towards the five disks. Last time I showed this, I focused on that we actually see quite a lot of diversity 
between the disks in terms of the structure. Also, if you look at the intensity, this is a logarithmic scale. Uh, it does vary by a couple of orders of magnitude uh, across the disks. But if we normalize this with how much water we think is in each of these disks, and this comes from theoretical uh, considerations, uh, the amount of hydrogen cyanide we have available for, for planets actually doesn't vary that much across four out of the five disks. So this is the percentage of hydrogen cyanide as a function of water in the inner 50 AU of our five disks. And in four out of five, you see that we're sitting somewhere between a per mil and a percent. Uh, this is the same as we see in comets in the solar system. So what it suggests is that the overall sort of organic chemical environment, at least with respect to these nitriles, um, in this, these, you know, this small sample of disks, is generally quite similar to what comets and asteroids and planets would have been seeing and developing out of in our solar nebula. We do see more complex organics as well, also in our program. Uh, they are all nitriles. And I'm showing uh, one, the, a small a portion of the data here. So the, the two main molecules that we focus on are these HC3N and CH3CN. So they both have this CN, this nitrile group in them, which is so important for the hydrogen cyanide. And I should say nitrile and cyanide is like the same thing. I have no idea why there are two names for it. I might be jumping back and forth. CN is the, is the key thing though. For these molecules, the emission is rather weak. You see these are like blobby, not so beautiful maps uh, here. So we can't use these kind of observations to tell directly how elevated the emission is in the disk. But we do have quite a few lines for each of these molecules. And based on that, we can determine what the internal excitation of those molecules are, and therefore which temperature uh, they are coming, which, what temperature regime they are emitting from. And if you recall, we have these beautiful empirical temperature maps uh, of our disks, and we can combine those two pieces of data to tell what height these molecules are emitting from. And we get two different, very different answers for these two nitriles. HC3N is coming from high up in the atmosphere, probably cannot impact planet formation very much. But the CH3CN uh, generally is coming from quite close to, to the midplane, right where planets are, are assembling, which definitely makes it an interesting ingredient for, what, for predicting, let's say, the compositions of, of exocomets. So if it was to sum up the kind of, the kind of organic chemistry that we see uh, happening in these disks, that will be really this nitrile chemistry. We do see some other organic molecules as well, but the ones we see the most often, it seems to be the most abundant, are these nitriles. And they constitute a really unique contribution to the overall organic inventory that we think planets, comets, and the like are forming from. And just remember, all these other reservoirs that we had coming from the earlier stages are still there. We just generally can't see them in this because they're all buried into these icy, uh, icy solids. The almost final thing that I want to talk about is bringing up a little bit of laboratory astrochemistry in trying to figure out how, where, the molecules like this um, acetonitrile or methyl cyanide uh, come from. Uh, most, many of these molecules, things like hydrogen cyanide, we think we have astrochemical models that explains its abundance pretty well. But there are some molecules, and this methyl cyanide, CH3CN, uh, is one of the molecules that we are currently under predicting in our models. And what that's telling us is that we're missing some formation, uh, formation pathway. So I had this amazing uh, undergrad student working with me the past year. And what she wanted to do for her senior thesis uh, was to basically start a journey of trying to figure out uh, 
where this molecule could possibly come from and see if we could design some laboratory experiments to try to constrain its formation pathway. So this is a picture of one of the experimental setups that we have at our disposal. And what is so cool with these experiments, and it's very different compared to what we do most of the time in astronomy, is that we can really you know, run experiments and sort of tweak parameters uh, on, in a matter of you know, days and hours rather than wait you know, millions of years for things to change uh, in space and see how the chemistry reacts to the tweaking of those parameters. In particular, what we do in these experiments um, is that we deposit very thin ices, sometimes only a couple of molecules thick. Um, and then we expose these ices to the same kind of energy sources that we think are available uh, in space, that these icy grains could be exposed to in space. And then we have different kind of techniques to see how this energy input uh, how that affects the composition and structure of the ice. And in this case, we're only going to be looking at what kind of new molecules uh, are forming. So what Alessandra, <coughs> so what Alessandra set out to do is to see if we could form uh, form this acetonitrile or methyl cyanide uh, through ice chemistry using what we think are the most common reservoir of nitrogen in ice, that's ammonia, as well as small hydrocarbons. And the small hydrocarbons uh, that we think are the most abundant based on uh, what's in comets are the ones listed here. So it's basically things like methane, ethane, acetylene, and so on. And to just combine that with UV uh, and then try to characterize what kind of chemistry occurs. Uh, the good news, uh, which is what's shown in the lower panel here, uh, is that it is possible to form uh, some methyl cyanide through this chemistry. You can actually form quite a bit. It is, actually, it is a fairly efficient way to form this, this key sort of complex nitrile. But you're only going to form it basically if you're starting with a specific hydrocarbon, uh, which is acetylene. Uh, the reason that you can form this molecule uh, via acetylene and not via the more hydrogen-rich uh, hydrocarbons, uh, we, th we think we understand, um, as in we think we have mapped out the formation pathway, that the, the way that you form this methyl cyanide is always by going through this so-called imine here, and this amine you form directly if you react ammonia with this acetylene or C2H2. Uh, this, however, poses a bit of a problem for this pathway being the main formation route towards this methyl cyanide. Because it means that you should always form a lot of this amine at the same time as the methyl cyanide. And that's what's shown in the top panel is actually the amount of this amine that we see in these experiments. And this amine we have not yet seen in disks at all. Doesn't mean that we have good constraints on it. We haven't actually been looking for it. Um, but this is a testable hypothesis, right? If this is the right formation pathway for uh, methyl cyanide, we shouldn't just see methyl cyanide. We should also see the corresponding uh, amine. amine. We are suspicious that we may not be able to find this. And we are also exploring other IC I see pathways, so sort of stay tuned for that, I guess, next year. Uh, but in the, meantime, in the meantime, I think this is just a, I guess, I guess a, neat, um, a neat experiment that has this very clear uh, prediction associated with it. The very last thing that I want to just give a teaser about is actually not chemistry at all. Uh, I mean, I hope that you are now all super excited about chemistry and disks and how important it is for plant formation. But even if you are not, uh, you should still be excited about the fact that we can map out molecular emission in these disks. Since this turns out to be one of the best tools you could have for understanding the dynamics of these disks. So I already showed you uh, channel maps of, a, uh, of one molecule CO. And this is just what they look like if you sort of sweep through these channel maps uh, towards, in this case, two disks. So it's both with, both with CL. Uh, 
And generally, when we do this, the disks look fairly Keplerian most of the time, uh, and mostly in, in CO. But we are starting to see some deviations. And what's pretty neat is that we can do this with CO, but we can also follow the dynamics of the disks using other molecules that trace different parts of the disk that are emitting you know, closer to the midplane or in particular, under particular kind of, uh, kind of conditions. And when we look at these very carefully, we do sometimes see things that are not that regular. The most extreme example is here, where we see this like crazy kind of gas structure that is surrounding a very well-behaved uh, dust, dust pebble disk. So the blue is the CO gas, and sort of the multicolor disk is what's going on uh, with pebbles. We also see some non-sort of regular motions when we sort of zoom in sort of tens of AU. And this is really, I'll say, at the front line uh, of what we can do with ALMA is to start characterizing this dynamic behavior of disks and then try to understand what underlying dynamic processes that is causing it. But with that, I would just like to, to summarize, uh, which is that if you want to understand the chemical environment within which planets form, you can't exclusively look at the disk itself, even though that's what I spent like 70% of the time on, because that disk does not start at zero, either in terms of the pebble, like what the pebbles are like, or the chemistry, or you know, the overall gas structure. A lot of that is, is inherited from the uh, earlier stages or set by what went on in the earlier stages of star and planet formation. Uh, when we do look at, at disks, we do see that the molecules that we would consider the most basic building blocks for an origins of life chemistry, they're generally there. They're generally quite abundant. And even though we see a lot of diversity and substructure across disks, if we zoom in on the part that I think is the most relevant for planet formation, we generally see quite a lot of it. And I think the final thing that I showed is that apart from these molecules really teaching, about, teaching us about the chemical structure of these disks, they are also providing really valuable probes of many things that you can think about sort of the physical structure or the dynamics uh, of these disks and trying to map out sort of one-to-one -one relationship between um, a molecule showing up and some sort of physical or dynamical process going on uh, is really where we're doing a lot of the work right now. And with that, thank you so much, and I'm happy to take any questions. was really, really good. Okay, so on Zoom, we have Chris Hayward, who's going to field the Zoom questions and the fifth floor classroom questions, and then I'm going to take care of the auditorium. So, director's prerogative. Uh, David can go first. Before I ask, as I ask my question, just remind people in the here and upstairs to hit their button to ask the question so people can hear on Zoom. And now let me ask my question which is the story with water has been that it comes late, either from comets or from uh, release from the rocks. You said that HCN is this key part of the story. Is the HCN coming early or late? Where, where, where does the HCN come from? And do we have probes like DCN to tell us what's going on with that? Uh, yes, that's a great and multifaceted uh, question. So we can't really use the DTH ratio here on Earth to say anything about that because it's so dominated by the water reservoir. We do have one DTH measurement of HCN in a comet, and it's high. In that one case, it's higher than water, which does suggest, uh, well, all it suggests is that it didn't form in the comet, but it formed you know, either in the disk or in the cloud, because there are actually lukewarm pathways to deuterated HCN, which there's not really for water that could have happened uh, in the disk. Um, so, but here on Earth, uh, here on Earth, since we, um, I think whatever had been incorporated, it's actually, 
It's not clear. So HCN in its sort of pure form, if it came in, you know, in if it was just a capture sort of physically in, let's say, a pebble or something like that, it would have been destroyed as a part of the earth warming in that first, first step. But you can actually have some fairly um, stable phases of cyanide where it binds with iron, where you could imagine that you can start sort of almost mineralize it and could release it at a later stage. Uh, but still, I don't think that much would have survived from that first stage. That leaves the sort of primary atmosphere and, and a later impact. In the case of Earth, it seems like we did lose most of the primary atmosphere. So in our case, that, that is not an important uh, reservoir, but one could imagine for some exoplanets it is. Uh, so that really leaves uh, things like uh, comets. And there we have done some calculations of how much uh, or things like hydrogen cyanide would survive a comet impact. And it's on the order of, if you integrate over all possible comet trajectories and such, it's on the order of a few percent uh, of that initial reservoir. So, so that is a plausible uh, origin uh, for at least localized uh, high, um, high concentrations of cyanide. Yes, I wanted to ask if you could elaborate a little bit more on the theoretical water component that you were comparing to and where you had that from when you were looking at the disks and how they're similar to comets. Um, in a great system. question that I was trying to sweep under the rug. So thank you for <laughs> pulling it back out. Uh, so, so where it comes from is that we um, can run models of how the, the chemistry evolves over sort of a million years in, in these disks. Assuming that we're starting with this water reservoir that I said came, came from the clouds, so that's what we do. And when you do that, you find that in most disks, most of the water survives. So you basically have the same amount of water per sort of grain or per hydrogen molecule at the, all through the disk lifetime as you started with. But in some cases, you do actually destroy some, some significant portion of it. Um, so this, uh, this, of course, brings in an uncertainty of this ratios that I was quoting. So I would say at, at best, they're order of magnitude, uh, order of magnitude estimates. Uh, but they can't be much uh, lower than what I said, because the uncertainty is really if you have destroyed some of that incoming water uh, during the sort of evolution of the disk, you don't really form any, any new uh, water. Uh, that also allows me to, I guess, bring one more thing to your attention. This is the Computational uh, Institute, which is that the, the real challenge for these disk uh, models and these disk chemistry models uh, is that we know that the dynamics and chemistry are coupled. Uh, but with a few exceptions, we haven't really figured out how to actually couple them uh, in a realistic way. So the models that I was just quoting, what they do is that you just come up with basically a reasonable structure of the disk, then assume it doesn't change that much for a million years while, while the chemistry evolves. But really you would want to, to couple the dynamical and the chemical evolution. And that is a big, big source of uncertainty. All right, so um, Chris, are there any questions in the chat? Oh. Okay, so unfortunately, it seems like Zoom is out of the question uh, right now. Well, and um, let's go back to the fifth floor classroom. So, Are there any sorry, Kiara, yeah. Kiara, I was just unmuted, yeah. so I can. So yeah, Mary Putman had a question. Do you, okay. have the abil do you have the ability to look for ongoing edge-on accretion in some of your systems? Um, accre accretion from the cloud or accretion from the disk onto the star? Maybe you should answer both. I'll take both. Uh, so the last, uh, the last image that I showed, which had this, you know, very reasonable-looking dust pebble disk, and that is kind of messy blue uh, seal gas around it. Uh, one of the possible interpretations of that image is that we're seeing very late, st late stage accretion uh, from the cloud onto the disk. So that simple picture that I presented with my cartoon, which is where that once you have the protoplanetary disk where planets are forming, you're sort of done when interacting with the, the natal envelope. Uh, that might not always be the case. You might actually get uh, 
uh, sort of new streams of sort of pristine material, material landing onto the disk also very late. We are not certain this is the right interpretation, but it seems like the most likely one. Um, in terms of seeing, do we see sort of accretions sort or of within the disk or onto the star? So with these observations, uh, we don't. Uh, but the main reason for that is that we are not really sensitive to the innermost AU, which is really where you have that accretion flow from the disk on, onto the star. And there are others who have been trying to look at this and, for example, to see what is the elemental composition uh, of material that used to be at one AU and is now falling onto the star. So there's some really interesting work there, but they're mainly using infrared and sort of optical UV observations rather than millimeter ones. The floor, classroom, we're back at, looking at you. Okay, we're going to come back to the auditorium. There's lots of questions here. Okay, so one, two, three. Yeah. Okay. Great talk and beautiful data. The, I was I was very uh, interested in your suggestion of, of the, the solution to this problem where you have you need too high a carbon to oxygen ratio. And you were saying, well, maybe that may come from the solid phase. So are you thinking about a chemical desorption mechanism? Or are you thinking about some sputtering mechanism? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. So, so I guess I should clarify that this is not my idea, but it's the idea of uh, a postdoc of Ted Bergen, Arthur Bosman, who just wrote a paper on this together with, with Ted. But the general idea is that early on in the disk, they're pretty dynamic, and we can see this for so this transition phase where you go from protostellar to this mature protoplanetary disk. There seems to be a lot of spirals and things going on. And at this phase that you have some um, sort of sweeping up of mid-plane, like carbon-rich grains up into the atmosphere, and there you have a combination of basically sputtering and inter uh, atoms uh, basically chemically destroying these, uh, these carbon grains. And once they are des destroyed, so they are you know, tiny carbon molecules instead of nice big pebbles, they don't fall back into the midplane. So you can actually maintain a pretty high carbon abundance, pretty high up in the atmosphere for a long time. So that is one idea. Uh, we don't know if it's correct yet and we haven't figured out at least I haven't thought about it. I have not figured out how to how to test it uh, compared to maybe some other suggestions, but I think it's a really interesting uh, idea. Am I am I on? Yeah. Actually, a bit of a follow up to Mary's question. Among the five discs, there was a really striking variation. All of them look beautifully ringed in the dust. And they had very different looks in the, in the five cases. So A, how much of the structure was it all real? And B, does it correlate with something like the age of the protostar or the luminosity of the protostar? Yeah, no, no, it, it, it's great. So, so I'll give you some, I guess, anecdotes. But <coughs> a sample of five, uh, these are all going to be anecdotes you're going to have to, in some sense, test with larger samples. Uh, the youngest disk in the sample, I am loop, does look chemically different from the other four. It has very little nitriles, for example, compared to the others. Uh, we think it is uh, because it is young, but we're not certain because, you know, one, uh, we, we would like to have at least three or four young disks and see the same thing uh, before we can say something certain. I am loop also happens to be the only disk in our sample that in the dust has a spiral, even if it is a rather a rather faint one. Uh, we do see some differences. We have two uh, disks uh, around more massive stars, around two solar mass, and then three around more solar mass stars. Uh, the two disks around the more massive stars, they are warmer, as you would expect, so that's good. Uh, they do uh, have somewhat different uh, chemical sort of overall abundances and structures as well, which we think probably is primarily due to the different the higher temperatures, but might have to do with the also higher UV radiation around those stars. Um, 
the one, the final one disc where we do see some very sort of distinct patterns is GMO Rigae, and that's a disc that has a giant hole at the center. So it's sort of a 20, 30 AU gap uh, at the center. And in that gap, we see something that looks very different compared to the other, other discs. So there are some things that we can start connecting with either the star uh, or the disc. In addition to that, it seems like in most of the disks, and I realize that's not very impressive with a sample of five, uh, the sort of the first major gap in each disk uh, looks um, different compared to the gaps beyond that, in that it uh, tends to have a lot of nitriles, for example. Uh, again, we would really need more statistics uh, to see if this is a fluke or something real, and I do hope that that's something we'll be doing in the in the coming years. But we are, of course, at the mercy of the ALMA attack. So we'll, we'll see how long it takes to get that, that larger sample. These are very expensive uh, observations. That is why there are only five disks in, in this first large program. Okay, so Chung Chung, and then um, one final sweep back to Zoom and the fifth floor classroom. Risky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so very interesting talk. I've learned so much uh, just from this presentation. Uh, so I was curious, very curious about uh, the gaps you mentioned at the early, maybe like second or third stage of the disk formation. Uh, so that include the CO gap, the dust gap, and also the two chemical gaps and rains. So I know you said the, the reasoning behind those, the location of those is very complex. But I was just wondering, what is the motivation to try to understand that in the first place, and does it like relate to the dynamics of, you know, early stage disk formation at all? You know, thank you for giving me a second chance to try to <laughs> try to motivate that. There were multiple reasons that we were interested in trying to to see if there were clear correlations between sort of the dust substructure on the one hand and sort of chemical rings and gaps on the other. Uh, the one that's closest to my heart is that we think that many of these dust gaps uh, are carved out by planets. So they mark sort of the locations where planets are currently accreting their atmospheres. So seeing if there are, like understanding the chemistry locally there uh, is important. And we suspect from chemical models that it should be different compared to the rings because you have a lot more UV that can penetrate into these gaps. So testing that, so just to understand compositions of planets uh, is important. Uh, but also, uh, there's been suspicions that some of these gaps might be caused by chemical substructures, the most obvious one being snow lines. So if we see signs of snow lines that coincides with gaps or rings, then maybe it goes the other way around, that we actually see the dust rings and gaps because we have this chemical uh, substructure uh, first. And I guess the, the final reason that we are really looking for connections is to probe the, the conditions of the gas uh, in, the, in these gaps more, more generally, it's like how much gas you have in these gaps. And that's um, important to, to test predictions of planet formation. Uh, so when, when people run the simulations uh, of um, sort of predict gap properties, from the properties of the planets uh, that are supposedly uh, forming in, in these gaps. Uh, they do predict uh, gas and pebble properties separately. And the only way we're gonna get to the gas is by using these different kind of molecules and try to infer uh, what the gas abundance is based on these molecular abundances. So that would be the third reason is to get, get a handle about the, of the gas abundance and, and test models of plant formation. Oh, thank you. Hey, Chris, are there any intelligent so, questions on Zoom? There are, there's, there's plenty, but I think uh, time for one or should I? Yeah, one please, and we'll wrap. So, yeah, so we have a question from Trevor David. Could Gaia provide astrometric sensitivity to planets at the separations at which Alma sees substructures? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, so in general, I don't think so, but there is at least one ALMA program that is ongoing to, to try to, to use uh, uh, um, astrometric observations 
Actually, I should take that back. I have no idea with Gaia. That's a great question. Someone else should answer that. But with, with, with Alma, there is at least one program that is ongoing uh, trying to do astrometric observations on a rather nearby star uh, with, with um, so-called debris disk to look, for, to look for companions that way. And I guess if you can do it with Alma, you could probably do it with Gaia too. So I should take that back. We could probably, that is probably totally doable and somebody is probably already doing it. Uh, great question though. Can you see these stars in G-band? In the visible? Um, yeah. Uh, most of the time. Some of them are, the ones that we picked here uh, should all be fine uh, because we needed um, to not have too much obscuration because then the molecules, the molecular emission gets all messed up. Um, if you look at programs that are only focusing on the dust, uh, it's uh, most of the time yes, but sometimes they are more embedded uh, just because they are not as sensitive to, to intervening cloud material. Okay, well, thank you everyone for your interesting questions and thank you again to our wonderful speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.